This week, we carry on our Skylab episodes by talking about the Smeet mission, which took place the year before Skylab was launched. You may have heard us mention it over the last few weeks. But what was it? And why was it important? Well, today, we're talking to John Urey, the manager of the NASA History Office at Johnson Space Center, to find out all about it. Do you have any memories of Skylab? Let us know via our social media pages at Space and Things 1 on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, or via the contact form on our website and please consider joining us over at patreon.com forward slash space and things but right now enjoy episode 144 of the space and things podcast I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Charles. And welcome to episode 144 of our podcast. I'm still on holiday. It's not actually that long of a holiday. It's just because of travel days. It it seems to have landed on the times when we normally record. Anyway, uh, this is a pre-recorded show that we made a few weeks back. uh, So there won't be any of the what caught our eye in spaceflight this week. But I think this is a great podcast episode this week. So I hope you enjoy it. Let's get straight into this week's main feature. While we've been celebrating the 50th anniversary of Skylab over the last few weeks, Dave and I realized that we probably needed to rewind the clock a little bit to discuss the Smeet mission, which you may have heard us mention over the last few weeks. Yeah, actually, this this episode came together well after we'd already planned what we were doing these few weeks when I was like, we really need to do an episode on that. Yes, SMEET is a wonderful NASA acronym used for the Skylab Medical Experiment Altitude Test, which was a 56-day Earth analog simulation of a Skylab mission which took place from 26th of July to the 19th of September in 1972 at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. The crew was Bob Crippen, Carol Bobco, and William Thornton, who would all go on to be Space Shuttle astronauts. Trapped in a small tin can for 56 days on Earth, let's find out what it's like by talking to the manager of the NASA History Office at Johnson Space Center, John Urry. Coming at you hotter than a hunk of Skylab over Australia, you're listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. All right. So, hello, John. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, So first, tell us a little bit about your background at NASA. You've worked both in a biomedical capacity and at its history office. That's right. So, yes, Emily, thanks for having me. Uh, Yeah, gosh, NASA, probably 35 years or so by now, 37, really, if you count my time as a contractor. Uh, And you're right, most of that was actually working in in the sciences, Uh, started in life sciences, really, uh, just doing some back in the shuttle days when they were still worried about space motion sickness. So that's, that was sort of my entry point. And then got involved with the Russian program and we started working with them on shuttle Mir. So I spent a good bit of my career doing that, including having to learn Russian, which wow. I soon forgot. <laughs> but so, you know, lots, lots of trips to Russia, working with the Russians. A great program. I mean, one of the best things I ever worked on. Then I transitioned, of course, into the International Space Station because he was kind of doing similar stuff once Shuttle Mir was over in 1998 and spent 12 years, I guess, of my life there at least, uh, maybe more. Yeah, something like that, 12 years. Then I actually went back to space and life sciences for a little bit to manage radiation, you know, ground-based research, which is critical for exploration missions. Of course. And then the opportunity opened up to come work in the history office, which, you know, to me, his, space history has always been a hobby. and I didn't even know, honestly, that we had a history office at that time, but they <laughs> said, hey, we're trying to ramp it up. And I said, would you be interested in running it? I was like, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> so I jumped on it, and that's that was the last six or seven years. Awesome. So let's fast forward. We're going to fast forward to the um, Skylab Medical Experiment Altitude Test, or SMEET, which mm-hmm. took place at Johnson Space Center for 56 days in 1972, which boasted future shuttle astronauts Bob Crippen, uh, Dr. Bill Thornton, and Bo Bobco as its crew. So what were the objectives of this exercise? Well, you know, they're getting ready to fly long-duration missions, which we had not done before. The longest flight we had was 14 days on Gemini 7. 
And we knew Skylab was going to be coming up, and there's going to be a different beast. It's going to be 24-7 operations for, you know, first mission, 28. And then at that point, it was two 56-day missions. Uh, and so they wanted to get some operational experience. You know, how did, what does it take to actually run a mission? It was a ground-based mission, basically. They tried to replicate as many of the Skylab uh, activities and hardware and so forth as they could. Uh, but they also wanted to get some ground-based medical data to compare against, okay, so we've, we're going to have the same enclosed environment, mostly. There are a couple small exceptions to that. And then we're, we're obviously not going to have weightlessness, but we will have the atmosphere reduced to five pounds per square inch, five PSI, which is what Skylab would run at. So any data that we then would get from Skylab, we could then compare, well, is that it couldn't have been caused by the atmosphere because we kept that constant. Couldn't have been the confinement. So was that weightlessness? And then you kind of you know, kind of play that that role. And it was a great test for the biomedical equipment too, because some of it hadn't really been tested yet and you know, in a thorough way across a 56-day mission, hmm. as well as the exercise equipment. And indeed they found some problems. And and that's why you do ground tests, right? Rather find the problem on the ground where you can fix it. Some of it was actually repaired and replaced during the during SMEAT. And then of course made the flights a lot better because the equipment had been, you know, tested, fixed, and operated much better and uh during the missions. You said about the SMEAT mission being useful in terms of having a control to be able to compare mm -hmm. how things worked with, with when the crew were in space. Was was there ever a discussion about using one of the crews that would go on Skylab to do the SMEAT mission or, or, or was that were they just too busy to do such a thing? Yeah, I think, you know, I don't know if there was discussion. None of it, I think, was documented. I'm sure people talked about that because obviously if you want to compare medical data between mm. ground and space, the ideal way to do it is to test it on the same people. Yeah. But again, th by that point, they were pretty heavy in the, into the actual training for Skylab. And so I think they really couldn't have taken two months. And, and it was more than two months because there was time before SMEET and after SMEET where they're very much involved with it. I know uh, the SMEET crew was, I think they were named sometime in 71, I think. And so it was a year run up basically. And you couldn't take one of the actual crews out of out of the service, if you will, for that long period of time and then put them right back into training. SMEET ended in September. The first fly was going to be at that point still in April of the next year. So it just wouldn't have worked. Biomedical data probably would have been cleaner just because it would have been the same people. But it's always a trade for something, right? So Absolutely. So before SMEET, NASA had held on the ground missions such as 2TV1 and LTA8. Mm -hmm. What was different about these tests in comparison to SMEET, and were there any similar objectives? Uh, there were. Uh, I, I would tell you the earlier tests you referred to, the you know the command module and lunar module tests in the vacuum chamber, also tested kind of the crew performance in the enclosed space, but it was more about the hardware, you know, testing out the spacecraft. You know, in the in the big vacuum chamber, especially for the two TV test. You know, they could actually irradiate it with solar heat and put it in cold. So they were looking at, you know, the thermal control of the spacecraft. Yeah, SMEET wasn't really about that because it wasn't an actual spacecraft. It was just the equipment put inside the chamber. And same with the LTV. I mean, the, uh, the lunar module test was also more about uh, the hardware itself. Although, of course, you know, when you, whenever you have humans in the loop, you know, that enters into it. So, mm -hmm. And they weren't that concerned about the bi biomedical data so much. Uh, it was more about uh, testing the hardware. And in the lunar module test was really about also testing the suits. Uh, so it was more more that that kind of thing. And I should mention durations were very different too. The you know the the two TV test was like I think seven or eight days, and lunar module ones were were much much shorter, of course, because we knew the crews wouldn't wouldn't be spending that much time in the in the lab. All right. So SMEET featured Dr. Bill Thornton as one of its astronauts or test subjects. Uh, mm -hmm. He would later fly aboard the space shuttle and is really an unsung hero of Skylab as he devised several medical devices and experiments aboard the space station. So um, what was it like working with him? You know, do you have any funny stories? <laughs> well, I'll be honest with you. My my entry to NASA was really through Bill Thornton. Uh, I had back when I was still in school, I was interested in doing something here at NASA and I really didn't even know what was available. So I just wrote a letter in the blind to the director of the Space Biomedical Research Institute at the time, Jim Vanderplug, and he put me in touch with Bill Thornton. So I came down here for a couple months. This was mid-80s. This was 
just prior to Bill's first flight on the shuttle. And he was still looking at space motion sickness. He was still a big issue for, for astronauts back then. And I helped him with some of that, did some, did some research. We actually drew some blood for looking at different parameters that might change with space motion sickness and so forth. And then after that, I came back more permanently to, uh, to JSC. So that Bill was really my entry. Of course, I always heard the stories about Skylab and things like that because he had been working on it. And I would find his research papers mm -hmm. and documents lying around and kind of, you know, sneak read them in a little bit like that. So it was, it was fun to hear those stories. But he is an unsung hero of Skylab. I mean, Smeet, I think, is overlooked by a lot of people. You know, I wore a Smeet t-shirt on the anniversary and people looked at me like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> it had the big Snoopy on it, so they got that part. But Smeet meant nothing to just about everybody, so I had to explain to them what it was. Uh, and of course, Bill, you know, designed some of the hardware. Now, also what may not be known to a lot of folks, Bill had an Air Force background. He worked at the, in the Air Force at, I think it was Brooks in San Antonio, Brooks Air Force Base, also designing some medical hardware. And some of that he brought over to NASA. And some of the hardware came from the manned orbiting lab because he had connections with the Air Force's manned orbiting lab too. So there was some there was some connection between those space stations, and some of that got incorporated into into Skylab. Uh, what I can tell you about Bill is he was a super super gentleman, and he was one of the most the hardest working people I've ever met. I mean, he worked all the time, but he didn't really necessarily expect everybody to do the same, but. He was also somewhat unforgiving sometimes. When he when he asked you to do something, you better do it. And by the time he asked you to do it, so but that's that's what gets results. So I really enjoyed working with him back then. And uh, you know, in fact, sadly, he passed away a couple of years ago. We just had the tree dedication ceremony for him here in, in just the past few months, and I had a chance to to go to that, which was really a moving experience. You know, there there's lots of funny stories coming out of Smeet about you know they they went uh, I think it was to Brooks and. Uh, they were teaching him how to how to pull teeth in case they had to do that during Smeet. And they had Whoa. this poor guy who came in with a toothache and they kind of drew straws as to who was going to pull his tooth and didn't really let on that they had no experience doing that. But apparently they did it really well because the guy thought, ah, this was great. This wasn't painful at all. So it was it was quite an interesting story. Amazing. Is the building still on the campus where that took place? Is it still the the same yes, place they do the, the, the test these days? Yeah, the, the chamber is still there. Uh, you know, it's been modernized a little bit. So I, actually, for one of the articles I wrote, I went in there and took a picture of the chamber kind of as a side by side comparison to 1972 and today. Uh, there's a lot more clutter around it, so it was harder to see the chamber, but it's still recognizable for what it is and it's still in use. Yeah. Wow. Iconic. Were the results of Smeet ultimately helpful in the three actual Skylab missions? And, and what kind of things did they learn during Smeet other than the fact that I think Thornton set fire to a bicycle at at, at bicycle <laughs> at one point? Yeah, well, Thornton was also one of the strongest people that I'd ever met. I mean, the guy worked out a lot, you know, at least when I knew him in the 80s. You know, and he kept doing that till you know, his ripe old age. I do know that for a fact. He was a huge fan of exercise. In fact, he was always on me for exercising more than I than I did because I didn't do much. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the data wasn't really used. I mean, if you look at the biomedical results from Skylab, it doesn't include the SMEET data because it's, it's non-flight for number one, different subjects. And the data was more as, as a, you know, kind of a rough comparison against the flight data. What they really learned a lot about is how to do the actual biomedical operations with the equipment and so forth, like you said. The, uh, the bicycle ergometer they had some issues with. I mean, they could not, I mean, Thornton basically burned it out. He rode it so hard. And then they, that's the one one thing where they kind of broke protocol and had to pass in a replacement through the, through the airlock. And even then it was limited to how hard they could exercise for a while because they're worried he would burn that one out too. Uh, I mean, he was, he was just, I mean, I had to take to use this. He was like an ox when it came to exercising. He was a very powerful, powerful, and he, he was a big guy. He was like six, one or something. He was one of the tallest astronauts in the program. So mo mostly he was learning those kind of procedures of how to do them, how to interact with the ground, you know, when to get help, when not to get help. Uh, those were eventually very useful for, you know, long-term operations that again, as I said, we really didn't have any experience with. Nobody did because the Russians only had, the first salute up at that point, and that lasted only 24 days and ended tragically. 
Uh, and it was also a very different vehicle. It wasn't really built to do biomedical science like Skylab was. But you know, Skylab had this very integrated program to look across human physiology at various aspects and see how they change in, in, in weightlessness. And to me, you know, it was, it, I would put that up against almost any current studies based on the technology that was available back then. It was just a huge square wave increase in our knowledge about human physiology and weightlessness. Yeah. One of our Patreon subscribers has sent in a really great question. John Wisenhunt has asked, comparing SMEAT to some of the more recent space analogs NASA and other institutions are doing, what has changed or improved? I would tell you the, the biggest thing is that uh, most of the analogs, well, there's, there's different analogs, obviously. You know, we have the ones that are carried out here in, in the chambers, you know, for 30, 45, I think think they go up to 60 and even 90 days. And, and that's, again, more testing protocols because the hardware is fairly well established. The chain, it's, and it's done in a chamber. It's not a, not a spacecraft kind of testing. Uh, a lot of bed rest studies that are going on. Again, that's more to get the actual biomedical data from the subjects to help design or drive studies that we would then do in, in space or to add additional data that you can't do in space. For example, we can't <laughs> we can't fly an MRI machine in, in orbit, so you can't yeah. do that part of an experiment. So the astronauts do it pre and post flight, but in a bed rest study, you can wheel the subject into the MRI machine. And so it, it, in some ways they're complementing each other, the complementary yeah. studies. In other, way, in other times, the bed rest studies are used as a precursor to test out new procedures. Uh, and then, then they will be tried, tried in space. And then, of course, there's the super long studies, like the Russians had the Mars 500, which was just a super marathon. Uh, and there's a, the new Mars study here that's ready to get underway with a, you know, the 3D printed habitat and so forth. So it's hard to compare them all because they all have different purposes. But I would, I would think, you know, and Skylab wasn't the only one, they, or SMEAT. They had some space lab ground tests later yeah. in the 70s that, that also were good simulations, again, for the hardware. Uh, none of them were as long as Smeet, of course. I think Smeet held the record back then for, for that kind of study uh, of that large magnitude. I know the Russians had done some simulations, but they're much, much more, uh, much simpler. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I forgot that they did Space Lab analogs back in the day. I forgot that. And I should have known that because uh, I've read a book about it. Bill Thorne was actually involved in one of those as well because he ended up flying on the Space Lab 3 mission in 1985, which is yeah. which is the one I actually helped him fly some, you know, a couple of very small experiments that we did back then. Nice. So. Okay, so another question is from one of our Patreon subscribers, Jen Jones, and she asks, slightly off topic, but what is the day in the life of a, for a NASA historian? Does it ever get old working at Johnson Space Center? No, it doesn't get old because every day I'm, I'm finding out new things, and, uh, and that's really cool. I don't just do history stuff. There's other duties as a sign that come with the job. For example, I mean, I, I sometimes give short tours or I'll give lectures. We have a speakers bureau and I participate in that. So I'll go out to different places and give talks about whatever subject they're interested in. And, and hopefully I'm expert enough to sound intelligent. Um, and just a few weeks ago, I just got this email this morning. So I'll share it with you because it's one of these that it's the kind of stuff that really makes me want to come back to work every day. A few weeks ago, I helped some students. I think it was in Ohio. I can't remember exactly now uh, who were doing a like a science fair project and they're making a documentary about the international geophysical year back in 1957-58 and they just wanted some background information for the project now i just got an email today that based on the information i provided in the documentary that they made they tied for first place at the state level oh, amazing and they were they were profusely like thanking me for my contributions and it was like okay that kind of validates what I do. <laughs> and, and especially when it's helping the next generation get inspired about space. Uh, I mean, some of us more seasoned, experienced folks, we all often take some of the space stuff for granted. But these, these kids were like genuinely interested in everything space. And this was like a fairly obscure topic in space history. And they, they li really pumped me for a lot of information and I provided as much as I could. And apparently some of it even made sense in the documentary. So. Uh, anyway, that's the kind of stuff day in the life of. It's hard to describe because that's kind of a one-off deal. I'll do one of those maybe every couple of weeks 
sometimes none for several months. It really varies. A lot of it is research. I do a lot of uh, writing of web articles, which I really enjoy doing. A lot of it started in the lead up to the Apollo 11 anniversary. I wanted to highlight some of the lesser known facts and incident incidents, uh, events that happened leading up to it. And that turned into like this whole series. And then when the Apollo anniversary was over, I was like, well, I can't quit now. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I went after Apollo 12, I, then, you know, Skylab happened. You know, there's all these other anniversaries just keep popping up. And then I do some fun ones about how do astronauts celebrate birthdays in space? Hmm. You know, kind of more the human interest side of the things. How do they celebrate Thanksgiving or Christmas or Hanukkah or, you know, any of those things? And so that's kind of the fun part of the job, really. And of course, that entails a lot of research. And that's where you have a lot of these aha moments. It's like things you never thought about. So now I understand why it happened that way kind of thing. So anyway, I, I hope that answers the question. It's that every day is a new day, I guess, is the way I put it. That's awesome. Yeah, I remember uh, the Smeet, one of the Smeet articles, I think you did a few Smeet articles. One of the Smeet articles, you did had some photos that I'd never seen before. You, yeah, you'd be surprised. You do enough digging and, and Google's very helpful. Uh, but, you know, NBC News had a bunch of articles, had a bunch of photographs I found from because one of their reporters, you know, Jessica Savage, who then went on to yep. NBC News nationally, she was the local NBC affiliate reporter here in Houston. And so she actually came down for Smeet and there's pictures of her, you know, near the chamber talking to people. So um, actually Bill Thornton, I think, in one of them walks right by Jas Jessica Savage. And it's like those kind of moments. I had never seen that picture either until I accidentally found it. You know, you do enough digging and sure enough, you find stuff. It's in like a, a big library, a NASA library at Johnson Space Center or an archive where you can just go in and, and look up paperwork is it all been digitalized or is it a bit of a mess <laughs> were, were you at the meeting i was in this morning because we were talking about exactly <laughs> that topic wow. uh, no the answer is uh there is a library which we, we're trying not to call it a library it's really a science and technology information center because a library implies or has the connotation if you go there you check out a book for two weeks and you bring it back and hopefully if you don't bring it back on time you get fined no, it's more, it's a much more living. There's documents there that uh, most of it is still paper and microfiche, believe it or not, because it goes back to Apollo days yeah, or even earlier, uh, Gemini days. Um, and then the more recent stuff does come in digital, but a lot of it is documents that then get revisions added to them. So librarians have to keep up with all the revisions that come in and so forth. So about 10% of the library right now is electronic. The rest of it is paper or microfiche. But with the new programs coming on, like with Orion and, and uh, even the commercial folks that come in, the SpaceX and other folks, okay, so how did Apollo test their parachutes? You know, how did they test the heat shield? They don't want to repeat the wheel or make the same mistakes that NASA's already made. It's like, where's the data? Well, it's there, but a lot of it's paper. And so somebody, in those cases, we digitize them so we could send it to the right people. But that's, again, a drop in the bucket to everything else that's there. So to answer your question, yes, there's a there's a library, if you will. The documents are there. They're not always readily accessible electronically. We also have a small kind of book library here in our little suite here that's, you know, a lot of the historical books that, you know, any space nerd would have probably at their house. And then the rest of it, some of it is done by, you know, outside sources. You look at, you know, press reports, uh, newspapers, magazines, so you end up going to Google and some of those archives, again, if they're accessible, some are pay as you go. And so that's kind of hard to, hard to reach. So you'd be surprised what you can find if you find the right keywords for searching. And uh, I, I guess I've built up a knack for that over the years. Absolutely. And then, and then there's of course the frustrating stuff of the things that you know is out there and you just can't find. Yeah. <laughs> and then you find it the day after the article goes live, you know, it's yeah. that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's probably in the room next door to you or the building next door to you where you actually you know, are as well. <laughs> there are things like, and that's, you know, you just say, okay, well, that's just law of life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or somebody else sends it over like, hey, were you looking for this? Like, God dang it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, what about this picture I've been holding on? It's like my, my next door neighbor used to work for NASA. He gave me all these pictures. And it's like, well, okay. <laughs> Would have been nice. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. That is so cool. So, okay. And finally, what do you think is Skylab's legacy as related to spaceflight physiology? I think Skylab, you know, pound for pound, given where we were in the early 70s, uh, I mean, it was usually 
using late 60s, early 70s technology. It was, to me, the, the best designed effort to study human physiology in long duration space flight. Because we knew nothing about it, really. I mean, it was all brand new. We were literally writing the book as we were flying Skylab. And the best part was, I think, the astronauts, all nine of them, agreed to have their names associated with the data, which made interpretation, at least publicly, a lot easier because you knew, okay, well, this is astronaut X's data, and so we know what he did, and that's why his results look like this. Even though astronaut Y flew the same duration, his data looks different because he didn't do some of those things. And so it made it easier to interpret and make sense out of all the data. Uh, and then, you know, when we started Shuttle Mirror, I'll tell you this, we actually eventually, because it was just on paper, this was all pre-digital in the 90s, we found a book that was called Lessons Learned from Skylab. Wow. And it was a treasure trove because it had a lot to do with how do you operate in long-duration spaceflight. All of us came from a shuttle kind of environment where you fly your seven days, you, you know, you timeline down to the second practically to get as much out of those seven days in orbit. And that's completely different from how you run Skylab or Mir or International Space Station. And that was a big aha moment for a lot of us. And it, okay. unfortunately, the lesson had to be relearned several times in NASA's history. But <laughs> by golly, I think we got it right the first time on Shuttle Mir. <laughs> And that was thanks to Skylab. <laughs> well, John, thank you very much for joining us. This has been a really, really fun interview. I'm sure a lot of people had not heard of Smeet or haven't heard enough about Smeet. I'll put uh, a link to some of your articles in the show notes as well so people can find out some more as well. Oh, that would uh, be great. Thank you. But, but thank you very much for joining us. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And I hopefully have you on again. We'll find something else to get you on about if, if you're willing to come back again. Uh, I would love to. This was a, lo a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. So thanks for the invite and uh, hope to see you all again sometime soon. Awesome. Thank you. Much. Thank you. Houston, Space and Things Base here. Dave and Emily have landed. So that was freaking awesome. Uh, I love John. Uh, John is awesome. I, I've talked to him a few times as he is part of the NASA history office. A uh, great wealth of, of knowledge and experience. He's been at NASA for quite some time, so he's seen a lot. Also, I, I love the Smeet articles. He did He did a, a series last year. I think he did a couple, two or three articles, and they're just excellent. Uh, there are pictures in there that are spectacular that I'd never seen before. There's one of uh, Bob Crippen's 35th birthday party, which is hysterical. Um, they had to do it via, I think, like uh, CCTV, basically. They had to do it by television because, wow. you know, Crippen was in, in uh, a vet, like the, you know, altitude chamber at the time. So they could, he couldn't just come out and have cake and, you know, stuff like that, <laughs> which kind of sucks. But they did it sort of by closed caption TV. And they had, a, I think, Dick Trulli was there. Rusty Schweikert was there looking like he was playing a guitar in Daisy Jones in the six. <laughs> yeah, he had like the full like 70s rock icon look going on. And Ed Gibson is there. And it's funny because Ed and Rusty are standing by each other and they couldn't look more different. Like Rusty looks like he's in like fog hat, whereas like Ed looks like a preppy. You know, he looks like a little preppy doctor guy, you know, so it's just... <laughs> Yeah, very 70s. Uh, I love it. The, some of the photos are just absolute. I mean, the the obviously the text is amazing too, but the the photos, I was like, oh my god, I've never seen this. This is incredible. Yeah, I I love John's articles, and he's done also uh, not just Smeet. He's done a wealth of other great space history articles as well. That you know, I've learned a lot from there because he has access to the archives at johnson so he can pull a lot of really cool interesting things you know that somebody like me who doesn't have access to that location readily i mean i could always fly there but still you know i can't just fly there all the time you know on my yeah. budget but his articles are really excellent you know he's talking about apollo 8 everybody kind of knows what happened during apollo 8 right but he delves into what led up to that sort of the enabling factors that okay why did they do it like this versus another way which is important to know if you're studying space history i think i mean i just loved that that interview i thought it was great it, it, yes to imagine working in building one in, in johnson space center that must be so cool that being your office going there every day i mean dream job i mean we it, right? it's like 
it's like when we spoke to Teasel at, at being the curator of the Apollo artifacts for the Smithsonian. I mean, they're, for people like you and I, they're dream jobs. You're having all that stuff around you, and especially with John, that location. I mean, just incredible. Yeah, You're at the heart iconic. of everything. Yeah, exactly. And the history's being made in front of you. That's as well. Like that, it's still going on. It's still happening now. Yeah, it hasn't ended yet. It's ongoing. Yeah. It's the story of human spaceflight and just any kind of spaceflight, not just human spaceflight. It's still ongoing, and it will be ongoing for hopefully a very, very, very long time. But yeah, I've I've have been in building one before. And it is just like For All Mankind. On the show, they did a spectacular job at replicating what Johnson Space Center actually looks like because, you know, it looks like that. It looks sort of like a very dry college campus kind of for a reason. When you go in Building One, you're like, man, this is like the real For All Mankind. It's just iconic, the the, the building and, and just how it's laid out. If um, money were no object and I could do whatever I wanted, you know, move wherever I wanted to... That would be the dream job. I would probably be like Margot Madison and have a bed in there, unfortunately. And my <laughs> my my husband would be get tired of that real quick. Seriously, it's just a it's just an amazing. It must be an amazing place to work. You know, it's just an iconic building, iconic campus, so much history there. I think the NASA history office has a really important role to play, as, as John said as well. That the outreach they do, helping out with 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 all kinds of people who want to know more about spaceflight and what nasa are up to and outreach is such a, a core part of what they're supposed to be doing it's in the charter yeah. it's hard especially i mean it's probably always been hard but the internet was probably supposed to make things a lot easier for for nasa to do that and yet you you're you've got so much noise to compete against and getting that yeah. story out about what happened and why it happened is difficult and I say it about what we do. Sometimes it feels like we're preaching to the converted. We're only talking to people who are already yeah. interested in this kind of stuff. And I'm sure people perusing the NASA history website are, are probably already interested. So it's hard to find the stories that can connect people to this and to what happened, especially when it was so long ago. And this whole 50th anniversary stuff has really got me thinking because... Mm -hmm. It's not actually that long ago. And, no. and yet it feels like ancient history in some ways as well, doesn't it? You and I don't consider ourselves old people. And yet this was within 15 years of us being born, 10 to 15 years of us being born, yeah. this stuff was going on. Yep. And, and this was five not, years before I was alive. That's it, five years is nothing. It's nothing. And, and yet it feels like a different yeah. time altogether. Uh, and it wasn't. And some of these people are still here with us to share those stories. And we're, we're lucky that they can do, the ones that still do. But it's important. These were such important things. And, and with spaceflight very much being the future, it really is going to be the future of, of what our civilization can do. And, and with that in mind, knowing the history of it is so important to me. I think it's really important. The same way learning the history of uh, other things that have absolutely revolutionized how how we work is also important and how we live it's important 500 years when they look back at this era it i i'm pretty convinced as i've said before it's going to be things like the apollo program that people are going to talk about and yeah. skylab is part of that uh, and as a result the smeet mission is part of that yep and, and these things when people look back and want to find out about them, it's people like John and their work and the articles they write now that are going to be the things that people find, hopefully, and and yeah. use them to learn about them. So when you're doing the work that he's doing, it's it's being done for the ages. That's the crazy thing, isn't it? This stuff is going to be archived and people are going to be able to find it. And when they're learning, oh, what's this thing, Smeet? They're going to find John. They're going to find his work. Yeah. Uh, and it's not just about connecting now. It's about connecting for all time. I find that fascinating. I agree with you totally. I think the NASA history office and people like, you know, John, they're doing such an incredible service, not just to the space community, but to humanity. Because yeah. like you said, Smeet to some, you know, might seem like an insignificant thing. It was a huge stepping stone and getting to Skylab, it would have not been the same program had they not done something like that. And I think that um, John writing about it, because there wasn't 
there really, up until his articles came out, there really weren't a lot of good standalone Smeet articles. I, I certainly did not. <laughs> I certainly was not writing about Smeet. I've written about Skylab, but not about Smeet as much just because I've read about it. It's kind of dry. I didn't have many plans to to write about it. But um, when you look at somebody like John putting those articles of, out there, those are kind of like the definitive articles on the internet about the Smeet program. And I think there's, I, I want to say, um, Johannes uh, from the Searching for Skylab team, he wrote a mini book on Smeet as well, which I believe is, I think it's available on Amazon as well. But these works, you know, are really the definitive guide on, okay, what was this? Why did they do this? What results did we get from this that led to us being able to take out, you know, take Skylab, you know, or undertake Skylab. That's the word I'm looking for. I think Bob Crippen's lucky his name's in the history books because of, of, of the space shuttle and the first flight of the space shuttle. But I mean, these are three guys who for 56 days agreed to go and be put into a, a tin can. It, I mean, it's hard. It's hard. Imagine having to turn around to your family and say, Hey, I'm going to be away for a, a few weeks, you know, a cu- <laughs> couple of months. In an well, altitude where, where chamber. Going? I'm just going to be, well, in fact, I'm only going to be about a mile away, but you're not going to be able to see me. I'm going to be locked away in this little little, little tin can. And and people are going to be like monitoring my every move and every yeah. single... All my inter- poops. Yeah, absolutely. People are going to be studying everything that I do and my heart rate at all times and all this, that and the other. Like... That's a tough thing to sign up for, especially yeah. when you live amongst the community of people that are doing those, <laughs> are, are yeah. being th- those invasive people in your life at that point. Yeah. You know, they live in the same neighborhood as you. The guy walking down the road is the guy that just analyzed your poo. <laughs> like- yeah, exactly. Yeah, the Skylab program was very <laughs> invasive as far as like what they did to astronauts. In Dr. William Thornton's papers, there's a lot of analysis about Skylab in their medical analysis, stuff that I honestly don't understand because I'm not a medical person. Yeah. But in his archives, and this this is I want to emphasize this is for medical purposes. He wasn't just collecting this to get, you know, for excitement or anything like that. He has photos of some of the Skylab astronauts in their skivvies, and that's for a reason. They were actually trying to see how much bone and muscle mass they lost in space before and after the missions because that's an issue in space if you're in space for a long time you're gonna lose bone and muscle mass unless you exercise a lot i'm looking at one of the pictures i'm not gonna i would never share it online or anything but i'm it's a friend of mine who happened to fly on skylab and he's in his underwear and i'm like these poor guys man they had to go through so much crap they had no privacy they really didn't. So yeah, that's something that I do think about is these th- these guys sacri- did sacrifice, you know, an awful lot. You know, and the Apollo lunar mission astronauts obviously sacrificed an awful lot. But I think as far as like being medical guinea pigs, the Skylab guys were it because yeah. they had to submit to a lot of stuff that I don't know if I would have submitted to. I would have been like, you aren't getting any pictures of me. Screw you. Yeah. <laughs> you guys ain't doing that. Nope, 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 nope. But um, they and they did it though, and I and like John said, the results from Skylab really helped with the ISS with uh, shuttle Mir. They were trailblazers, and I don't think we recognize that enough. We really don't. We really don't. We absolutely don't. Anyway, the full unedited uh, interview it will be up on our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash space and things. And I hope that people have enjoyed are uh, four weeks of Skylab-related episodes and topics to celebrate the 50th anniversary. We've got more coming later this year as, as yes. Skylab 3 and 4 launch and we're underway. We're going to do a few other things, bits and pieces. And some people might think that we're doing too much, that there's other things we're perhaps missing out on. But this is one of those, I think this if this episode doesn't uh, highlight it enough, it's the kind of thing that people need to learn about. Like this, yes. this is that's the unsung heroes of space flight that you and I have talked about again and again. It's the stuff that people don't necessarily know about. I'm learning so much doing these podcasts. Yes. Because I didn't know about it. Like there's so many things we're learning and still learning about that, that in the people should know about this. These programs were important. This was important stuff. And 
they laid the groundwork for where we are now. You know, the ISS, all that kind of stuff. Gateway, all yeah. stems back to Skylab. Uh, yeah. And those original programs. These are stories that have not been told as much. We don't hear them as much. And I think for the record, it's very important that we put it out there. Because yeah. I feel like it's setting the precedent to somebody maybe in the future, you know, how many ever years from now might come listen to this podcast and think, wow, I'd never heard of that. Maybe I should dig more into that. And I think that's where a lot of the best space history I've read has come from, where you see somebody who's like really just digging into stuff that hasn't been quite discussed before. And and certainly as we've done these last four weeks, I've also been reminded of our interview with Rusty Swicart and our interview with Dr. Joe yes. Kerwin about Skylab. There, What happened there? I mean, Rusty's interview about how he was involved in the preparations for for that first Skylab crew mission. I mean, that was just a wonderful interview, and which which reminds me that I've been given a job, which I don't know when I'm going to get done. But Toby, one of our patrons, has given me this job, and he's helped out massively by already. He's already started a spreadsheet, which really helps. Our website has our archive, which is all of our podcasts. It's just in order of when we did them. And it needs to also be slightly more topic-based so that if someone says, right, Skylab, all the episodes that may be about Skylab will be together. Or, uh, yeah, the Russian that's Space a great Program, idea. Or, yeah, so it's going to take some time. To, it's going to require re- redesign. And, yeah, because we, yeah. we have a big archive, yeah. Yeah, and also, like, I had to earn a living. <laughs> and, exactly, <laughs> so, yeah. To take the time to do that when the, the podcast takes up quite a lot of time anyway is quite difficult, but... Toby's yeah, done a great understand. job at getting the, the spreadsheet started. So now all I've got to do is figure out a way of making that work on Squarespace. And if someone wants to help me out with that, they can do. But uh, yeah, it's a, something that I think will be important because we're now getting to 100, episode 150 is coming up and that's a lot of stuff. And if yeah. someone's only interested in Space Shuttle or, or, or other things, then they can go and find it. Or if they want to just browse topic history, topics and they see a topic that they don't know much about then they can have episodes uh, that they can go and look at and it might open up their eyes to a, a, an area of spaceflight history or spaceflight future that they may not have thought about uh, as we try and cover a little bit of every, everything and from that research that Toby has done putting everything in, into order for us he's noticed that we've actually only ever done one episode dedicated to the Gemini program which is ridiculously poor on our, yes. our part Emily we need to make amends of that but that's a whole other thing that's a whole other thing anyway I agree uh, anyway this ends for now our Skylab coverage <laughs> and remember when you're sleeping in space no one can hear you dream Right, that's it for this week. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. As we mentioned earlier, I'm still away, so know what caught my eye in Spaceflight this week's section. But we'll be back in a couple of weeks. Thanks again to those who have joined us over on Patreon. It's very much appreciated. Please head over to patreon.com forward slash space and things to find out more. Next week will not be about Skylab, and I assure <laughs> you that no matter how much that that might hurt you, it hurts me a lot more. But... <laughs> We've still got something great planned, but in the meantime, don't forget, in space, no one can hear you mean. You're listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. <laughs>